Today we're going to look at two pretty average looking limits, but I think in the end you'll see that I've made a joke right here. Okay, so let's see. The first one which we'll calculate is the limit as n goes to infinity of the nth root of a plus the nth root of b over 2 all raised to the n power. Okay, so let's get going on that. Let's notice that we can also rewrite this using a change of variable where we set x equal to 1 over n as the limit as x goes to 0 from above of a to the x plus b to the x all over 2 to the power of, let's see, that'll be 1 over x now. So like I said, all we did there is we did the change of variables for the limit where we set x equal to one over n, but if n is approaching infinity, then that means x is approaching zero from above. But let's notice that this is an indeterminate form. That's because as x approaches zero, this approaches one plus one over two, that's equal to one, and this approaches infinity. So this is an indeterminate form of type one to the infinity, one of these exponential indeterminate forms. And how do we evaluate those? Well, the standard trick is to take the log of both sides, and after taking the log of both sides, we can apply L'Hopital's rule. So let's see, applying the log of both sides will give us one over x, and then we'll have the log of a to the x plus b to the x over two. But now I'm gonna rewrite this just a tad. We have that limit as x goes to zero from above, and then I'll write a numerator as the log of a to the x plus b to the x minus the log of two, using some logarithm rules. And then my denominator will be x. But now looking in at this, as x approaches zero, this numerator approaches log two minus log two, which is zero. And then this denominator also approaches zero. So that means we can apply L'Hopital's rule. In other words, this limit will be the same thing as the limit determined by the function where we take the derivative of the numerator and the denominator. So let's do that. We have the limit as x goes to zero from above of the natural log of a times a to the x plus the natural log of b times b to the x all over a to the x plus b to the x. And that's after all is said and done. So how did we get that? Well, notice the derivative of the inside is exactly this numerator, keeping in mind that when we take the derivative of a to the x, this natural log of a pops out. I guess now is a good time, or probably a few minutes ago was a good time, to point out that here we really need a and b to be positive real numbers, otherwise a bunch of these calculations don't make sense. Okay, and then our denominator is this a to the x plus b to the x just by the derivative rule for the natural log. But now let's check, if x approaches zero now, we'll have the natural log of a times a to the zero, so that's just natural log of a. Then we'll have a natural log of b, and then in the denominator, we'll have one plus one, which is two. So in other words, we have natural log of a plus natural log of b all over two. But we can put that together to give us the natural log of a, b, over two, or in other words, one half natural log of a, b, but that will quickly simplify to the natural log of the square root of a, b. But that's the log of our limit, and what we really need is the limit. So we exponentiate both sides, and we see that we get the square root of a, b. Oh, but let's notice that that's the geometric mean of a, b. And perhaps that makes sense because this is the limit of some sort of strange average of a and b. Notice if we set n equal to one, we simply get a plus b over two, which is the arithmetic mean. So this is some sort of tweaking of the arithmetic mean. Okay, so now let's jump into L2, but I believe that we can calculate L2 without changing much here. Notice I can change this one to two, but then I can just replace n's with x's, so I'm doing a change of variables again, 
but now my x will approach infinity. And that's just because I'm replacing n with x. Now, that may not seem like super important to do, but in fact, maybe grammatically it's more correct because n is generally a discrete variable, whereas x is a continuous variable. And if we're gonna like apply L'Hopital's rule, then perhaps we would like a continuous variable. Okay, so now let's see what sort of indeterminate form we have in this case. And now as x approaches infinity, well, what happens to these two things really depends on the size of a and b. If one of them is bigger than one, then this whole thing approaches infinity. If one of them is less than one, or if both of them are less than one, then this thing approaches zero. And if both of them are equal to one, then this approaches one. But either way you, you look at that, that is an indeterminate form. It's either an indeterminate form of type infinity to the zero, which I guess I should say this exponent is going to zero, or of type zero to the zero, or of type one to the zero. So those are all indeterminate forms, which means we can apply L'Hopital's rule after this sort of simplification here. So let's maybe just change what we need here. We'll change that one to a two, and this is gonna change to inf infinity, and then this is gonna change to an infinity as well. But now if x approaches infinity, let's notice that this only approaches infinity over infinity if at least one of a or b is bigger than one. So let's maybe make that assumption kind of built into here. And let's put it with both of them just to keep it simple. A and B are both bigger than one. And then, like I said, in that case, we do have an indeterminate form of type infinity over infinity. Maybe write in the comments what's happening if you know both of them are less than one or maybe they're both equal to one. Okay, so anyway, we can apply L'Hopital's rule again, and we'll end up with this limit. But now, the final step to this equality is no longer valid, and we can't just fix that with a little bit of erasing and rewriting, so let's get rid of those last couple of calculations, and then we'll finish it off for this case. Okay, so now that we've got that set up, we're actually gonna make an assumption, but this assumption, it doesn't lose any generality like our assumption before, which would technically require us to check some extra cases. Now, without loss of generality, let's assume that A is bigger than B, or maybe bigger than or equal to B. And of course, this assumption can just be made by switching the roles of A and B. The roles of A and B are symmetric over here, so they should be switchable. Okay, then from here, what we'll do is multiply the numerator and the denominator by one over A to the X. So that's gonna give us the limit as X approaches infinity of, we'll have the natural log of A plus the natural log of b times b over a to the x power all over one plus b over a to the x power. But now notice if a is equal to b, then we just simply have a one here, we have a one here, we have natural log of a plus natural log of a over one plus one, so in the end we get natural log of a. But if A is strictly bigger than B, then something a bit more interesting happens, and that is as X approaches infinity, this term tends off to zero, and this term also tends off towards zero. So let's just point out that that's happening if A is strictly bigger than B. The other case was handled with my words. And that's because you're exponentiating a number which is smaller than one. Well, it's between zero and one. And that just leaves us with the natural log of A. Okay, but that's the natural log of our limit. That means our final limit, L2, is equal to A. But remember, that was making the choice that A was bigger than or equal to B. So maybe putting some generality back into that, let's notice that this is really the maximum of A, B. We just like randomly chose A to be the maximum in that case. So we have our first limit is the geometric mean. Our second limit is this maximum value, which is actually a type of mean. 
let's maybe zoom out a little bit and see if we can get a bigger picture of what's going on here. So here's a zoomed out picture of what's going on here. So it relates to the arithmetic geometric mean inequality. And in fact, there are some other means that you can put inside of this inequality, like for instance, the harmonic mean or the quadratic mean. So it has this nice string. So the minimum of A and B is less than or equal to the square root of AB, that's the geometric mean, which is less than or equal to this A to the one over N plus B to the one over N over two to the N. Maybe that's like the one over N mean, and that's less than or equal to the A plus B over two, which is the arithmetic mean, and that's less than or equal to this a to the n plus b to the n over two all to the one over n. Maybe that's the nth mean, which is less than or equal to the maximum of a and b. So we didn't prove any of these inequalities, but those hold. And then what we showed today is that this thing right over here, this one over n mean has a limit as n goes to infinity of this geometric mean. Furthermore, it doesn't really have what you would call a limit, but it has like an evaluation to the arithmetic mean if you set n equal to one. So it is related to the arithmetic mean. And then further, this nth mean over here has a limit as n goes to infinity of this maximum value. And again, it doesn't have a limit to the arithmetic mean, but it has some sort of evaluation at n equals one to the arithmetic mean. So I think this is like a nice bigger picture view of this maybe what seems just like a simple limit problem. And it is, as a limit problem, fairly simple. But I think if you take this broader view, it like shows these nice connections between these different ways of averaging two numbers. And that's a good place to stop. Thanks for watching and sticking around until the end of the video. And since you're here, don't forget to gently press that like button. Subscribe, ring the bell, and select all notifications to never miss a video. If you want to get your name in the credits like you see here, access the live seminar series, review videos before release, and more, go to patreon.com slash michaelpenmath and become a Patreon member today. If you want full ad-free course content, subscribe to my second channel, Math Major. I've got courses on linear algebra, complex analysis, and proof writing, among several others. And that's everything. Bye.